GT Machine, General Disassembly, and Reassembly. Think safety first. Prior to performing any work, make sure any and all necessary safety precautions have been followed and the elevator has been taken out of service. Follow any and all necessary electrical safety requirements when working with and around electricity and make sure proper PPE is worn. When hoisting equipment, ensure that proper lifting equipment and safe lifting practices are followed. For these demonstrations, the Hollister Whitney GT31 overhead geared traction machine is used. To disassemble this machine, begin the process by draining the oil. This can be done by removing the oil drain plug from the lower housing at the rear of the machine. Next, remove the outboard stand. To do this, start by removing the shaft cover on the outboard stand by removing the three bolts that secure it to the outboard stand. Then remove the four bolts that secure the outboard stand to the machine base. Before pulling the outboard stand off the bearing, be sure to mark the number and location of shims under each mounting location. It may be necessary to slightly pry up on the outboard stand to remove the shims. Once the shims have been marked and removed, the outboard stand can be pulled off the bearing straight and level, being careful not to pop the seal on the bearing. It is a slip fit and should not require excessive force or a pulling device. Next, remove the motor. Be sure to make sure all electrical connections are disconnected from the motor and encoder, and the motor is properly and safely supported prior to removing the motor. First, remove the eight bolts that secure the motor adapter plate to the machine. It may be beneficial to remove the bottom bolts first, leaving the top bolts till last to take any cantilevered load. Once all the mounting bolts have been removed, the motor can be pulled away from the machine. Be sure to pull the motor away from the machine straight and level as the coupler disengages. Once the motor is removed, be sure to note the location of the flexible component of the connection as it could remain in either the motor or worn half of the flexible coupling assembly. Next, remove the brake drum. Start by finding the tab on the lock washer that is bent in that locks the lock nut in place and then bend the tab on the lock washer out to unlock the nut. Then remove the lock nut and the lock washer from the worm shaft. To remove the brake drum from the worm shaft, install two long jack bolts referenced in the manual into the tapped holes provided in the brake drum. Note the jack bolt location of engagement on the front bearing housing to ensure they engage on the bearing housing surface. With the brake held open, alternate torquing of the jack bolts in small increments until the brake drum pops loose from the worm shaft, and then remove the brake drum. Next, remove the upper housing. Start by marking the location both the inside and outside eccentric on the lower housing for future reference. Then loosen all eccentric bolts, but do not completely remove them. Using jack bolts referenced in the manual in the jack bolt locations provided, around the eccentric, slightly pull the outer eccentric away from the housing assembly, taking special care not to over torque the bolts or excessively move the eccentric, then remove the jack bolts. With the eccentric slightly moved away from the housing, rotate the shims out on the upper bolts that secure the outside eccentric to the upper housing so they can be seen. While holding the shims, remove the two upper bolts on the outside eccentric. Note the number of shims under each bolt as they are removed. Also, remove the two upper inside housing eccentric bolts. Note there are not any shims under the inside eccentric bolts. Remove the eight bolts that secure the upper housing to the lower housing. Install jack bolts in the jack bolt locations provided in the upper housing adjacent to the mounting bolts and use these jack bolts to separate the upper housing from the lower housing. Ensure that the upper housing is separated from the lower housing far enough to clear the alignment pins with the jack bolts or pry with a bar, then remove upper housing. Before proceeding with removing the center assembly, ensure that it's adequately and safely supported prior to removing the hardware. With the eccentric still slightly moved away from the housing, rotate the shims out on the lower bolts that secure the outside eccentric to the lower housing so they can be seen. While holding the shims, remove the two lower bolts on the outside eccentric. Note the number of shims under each bolt as they are removed. Also, remove the two lower inside housing eccentric bolts. Note there are not any shims under the inside eccentric. The center assembly can now be removed by lifting it straight and level. If the gear is to be replaced, it can be removed next. 
First, remove the nuts on the six body bolts that attach the gear to the gear hub and tap out the body bolts with a soft hammer. With the body bolts removed, heat the gear until it expands enough to spin freely on the gear hub and remove the gear. It may be necessary to lightly tap around the gear with blocking and a soft hammer to aid in its removal. With the gear removed, lightly file the mating gear hub face to remove any burrs and wipe down to remove any debris. Wipe down the replacement gear to remove any possible debris. Heat the replacement gear adequately so it expands enough to slide on the gear hub. Light tapping is acceptable to mount the gear, but it should not take excessive forces to slide the gear on the hub. If the fit is too tight, add additional heat to the gear for additional expansion. While the gear is still warm, quickly rotate it to line up the mounting holes before it cools on the hub and install two standard non-body bolts referenced in the manual 180 degrees apart to hold the gear in place while it cools. While the gear cools, it's a good time to replace the worm if needed. Ensure the key is removed and then wrap tape around the worm shaft keyway and threads to not damage the seals in the forward end bearing cap while removing. Remove the six bolts from rear end bearing cap. Then remove the rear end bearing cap. Note the number of shims under the rear end bearing cap for future reference. Remove the six bolts that secure the forward end bearing cap and then remove the forward end bearing cap. Be careful not to damage the seals in the forward end bearing cap while removing. Note only one shim and gasket is on the front end bearing cap. Also note that the drain hole on the forward end bearing cap is oriented to the bottom and will need to be reinstalled later with the same orientation. With both bearing caps removed, the worm can be removed either out of the front or rear end bearing cap opening. Note the inner raises and taper roller bearing should stay attached to the worm shaft. Remove any outer races that may still be in the lower housing. Prior to installing any new components in the lower housing, make sure it's clean. Install a new outer race on forward end bearing location. Light tapping with a soft hammer may be necessary. Install the forward end bearing cap. Note one gasket shim should be in place and the drain hole should be oriented to the bottom most position. Install the six forward end bearing cap bolts and torque them to the value listed in the manual. Then install the worm. Typically the worm will come from Hollister Whitney with the taper roller bearings pre-mounted. Wrap tape around the new worm shaft keyway and threads and be careful to support the worm as it is being installed so not to damage the seal in the forward end bearing cap. Install the rear end bearing outer race. Prior to installing the rear end bearing cap, make sure more gasket shims are on the rear end bearing cap than were taken off to ensure not to over preload the taper roller bearings. Install the rear end bearing cap and tighten the six mounting bolts to the torque specs listed in the manual. Install the dial indicator on the front of the worm as shown to check the end play in the taper roller bearings by forcibly pushing and pulling the worm axially. Check the end play measured against the value in the GT machine manual. If the value measured is greater than the end play recommended in the manual, shims will need to be removed. If no end play is measured and the worm is difficult to rotate, shims will need to be added. Remove the rear end bearing cap and add or remove shims as necessary. Reinstall the rear end bearing cap and tighten the bolts. Recheck bearing end play and repeat the process until end play corresponds to the value in the manual. Next, install the brake drum. Remove any tape that may still be present on the worm shaft keyway and wipe clean. Install the drum key. Wipe the drum taper bore clean. With the brake held open, install the drum ensuring that the keyway is lined up with the key while inserting. Install the lock washer with the tab in the slot, then the lock nut with the chamfer to the inside facing the drum. Hold the brake open and tighten the lock nut. Ensure one notch of the lock nut lines up with one tab on the lock washer. Bend this tab over the lock washer into the notch on the lock nut. Mounting of the gear can be resumed if the gear has adequately cooled. Ream the four body bolt holes through the gear and gear hub that do not have the temporary clamping hardware installed. Install the four new body bolts in these four bolts so the nut is facing towards the traction wheel. Tapping the body bolts to install them with a soft hammer may be necessary. Remove the temporary clamping bolts and install the last two new body bolts in the same manner that was previously done. Torque the six new body bolts in an alternating crisscross rotation to the value in the manual to complete the gear mounting procedure. Next, install the center assembly 
Begin by cleaning the mating surfaces of the lower housing and the mating surfaces on the eccentrics. Inspect the seals on the eccentrics and replace if needed. Lower the center assembly into the lower housing, making sure it is straight and level while doing so. It may be necessary to rotate the worm by turning the brake drum while lowering the center assembly to ensure that the gear teeth mesh properly with worm teeth. Orient the location of the notches as they were noted prior and line up the marks on the eccentrics with the marks that were made on the lower housing prior to removal on both the inside and outside eccentric. Start with the same number of shims that were removed between the eccentric and the lower housing and install the two outside eccentric bolts in the lower housing. Install the two bolts that secure the inside eccentric to lower housing. Note, no shims are needed between the inside eccentric and the lower housing. Next, install the motor. Prior to reinstalling the motor, reference the manual for a lubricant to be applied to the flexible part of the coupling. Then make sure the flexible part of the coupling is inserted in the brake drum. Ensure that the motor adapter plate OD and the machine mounting flange are clean of any debris. Bring the motor in straight and level. Make sure the coupling is properly lined up as the motor is brought up to the flange. Install the eight motor mounting bolts. It may be beneficial to install the top bolts first. With the motor installed, wire it up so it can be used to rotate the worm and gear set to check the pattern. Next, check the worm and gear contact pattern. Before proceeding, note the factory worm and gear contact pattern on the gear that was removed. Then wipe down at least a 4-2 section of the gear and blew at least two teeth in the middle of the clean section. If you're resetting a gear that was removed from the machine, it may be beneficial to blue a section adjacent to the factory pattern. It may also be beneficial to mark the location on the traction sheave that corresponds with the bluing on the gear to easily identify while rotating. Rotate the sheave both directions and stop the gear where the blue section is visible. Check the pattern against the factory pattern noted. The ideal pattern would be a center pattern on both flanks of the gear tooth. Note the GT Series machine worm and gear contact pattern can be checked with no load on the wheel if a wet type bluing is used as shown. The pattern can be adjusted left or right by adding or removing shims under the outside eccentric mounting bolts. If shims are adjusted, repeat the bluing and pattern checking process until an acceptable center pattern is obtained that is consistent on both gear tooth flanks. After an acceptable pattern is obtained, the backlash of the gear set needs to be checked. Place a dial indicator on the gear tooth and check backlash as shown. Compare the backlash reading to the value in the manual. If the backlash measured is out of tolerance, the backlash can be adjusted by rotating the eccentrics up or down. Rotate the eccentric moving the notch up to increase backlash. Rotate the eccentric moving the notch down to decrease backlash. Make sure the mounting holes line up to the next corresponding set in the pattern as they're rotated. Only adjust the eccentrics one mounting location at a time and make sure both the inside and outside eccentric are adjusted the same amount and in the same direction. It also may be beneficial to slightly lift up on the center assembly as the eccentrics are rotated to ensure the O-rings on the eccentrics are not damaged while rotating. If backlash adjustments are made, repeat the pattern checking procedure to confirm the pattern did not change. Repeat the pattern and backlash adjustment process until the pattern and backlash are both acceptable. Next, install the upper housing. Ensure that the lower housing surface is still clean and free of debris. Apply a bead of silicone to the lower housing inside surface and a bead of silicone along the bearing as shown. Wipe down the upper housing and make sure it is clean and free of debris. Make sure the jack bolts are removed from the upper housing if not already done so. Note the location of the alignment hole in the upper housing and the alignment pin in the lower housing. Lower the upper housing straight down and level in the proper orientation so the alignment pin goes in the alignment hole. It may be necessary to tap with a soft hammer to full seat. Install and tighten the eight bolts that secure the upper housing to the lower housing. Wipe off any excess silicone that may have extruded. Using jack bolts in the jack bolt locations provided around the eccentric, very slightly pull the outer eccentric away from the housing assembly taking special care not to over-torque the bolts or excessively move the eccentric. Install the two outside eccentric bolts with the same number of shims as were used in the lower housing. Remember to remove the jack bolt before fully tightening the outside eccentric bolts. Install the two inside eccentric bolts. Note, no shims are under the inside eccentric bolts. Next, install the outboard stand. Bring the outboard stand over to the outboard bearing straight and level and guide on until the bottom stop meets the pin 
being careful not to pop the seal on the bearing. Start by installing the same shims that were removed. If the eccentric clocking was changed from the initial position to get the required backlash, more or less shims will be required. Install and tighten the four bolts that secure the A-stand to the machine base. Place a dial indicator on the shaft and check the outboard stand alignment to the shaft as shown and compare the reading to the value in the manual. If needed, the alignment can be slightly adjusted as needed by tapping the A-stand with a soft hammer. To complete the assembly of the machine, install the outboard stand shaft cover and three mounting bolts. After the machine is fully assembled, recheck the gearing backlash and pattern through the inspection port. Be sure to add oil into the machine and fill it to the proper oil level before putting back into service. Thank you for your interest in Hollister Whitney GT Series Geared Traction Elevator Machine. If you have additional questions, please contact Hollister Whitney at the information listed on your screen. Be sure to reference the support section of our website for the latest manuals and technical information.